Chapter One of the Tenant of Wildfell Hall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. Cast of Characters Gilbert Markham, read by Dublin Gothic. Mrs. Markham, read by Anise. Rose Markham, read by Tiffany Halla Colonna. Fergus Markham, read by Max Schörlinge. Helen Graham, read by Amanda Friday. Master Arthur Huntingdon, read by Grace Garrett. Frederick Lawrence, read by Robert Hoffman. Reverend Millward, read by Martin Geeson. Eliza Millward, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Mary Millward. Read by Charlotte Duckett. Miss Jane Wilson. Read by April Gonzalez. Mrs. Maxwell. Read by Avayi. Mr. Borum. Read by Ernst Bottinama. Arthur Huntingdon. Read by Chris Marcellus. Annabella Wilmot. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Mr. Maxwell. Read by Ken Garrett. Millicent Hargrave. Read by Christine G. Lord Libra. Read by Algie Pug. Mr. Grimsby, read by Chuck Williamson. Ralph Hattersley, read by Jessa Mills. Rachel, read by Bev Stevens. John, read by Chuck Williamson. Walter Hargrave, read by Noel Badrian. Esther Hargrave, read by Beth Thomas. Mrs. Hargrave, read by Rhonda Fetterman. Servant, read by Ken Garrett. Coachman, read by Algie Pug. Traveller, Read by Chuck Williamson. Elderly Traveller. Read by Ernst Batinama. Benson. Read by Algie Pug. Old Woman. Read by Rhonda Fetterman. Narrated by Elizabeth Clatt. Chapter One. You must go back with me to the autumn of 1827. My father, as you know, was a sort of gentleman farmer in Shire, and I, by his express desire, succeeded him in the same quiet occupation not very willingly for ambition urged me to higher aims and self-conceit assured me that in disregarding its voice i was burying my talent in the earth and hiding my light under a bushel my mother had done her utmost to persuade me that i was capable of great achievements but my father who thought ambition was the surest road to ruin and change but another word for destruction would listen to no scheme for bettering either my own condition or that of my fellow mortals he assured me it was all rubbish and exhorted me with his dying breath to continue in the good old way to follow his steps and those of his father before him and let my highest ambition be to walk honestly through the world looking neither to the right hand nor to the left and to transmit the paternal acres to my children in at least as flourishing a condition as he left them to me well an honest and industrious farmer is one of the most useful members of society and if i devote my talents to the cultivation of my farm and the improvement of agriculture in general i shall thereby benefit not only my own immediate connections and dependents but in some degree mankind at large hence i shall not have lived in vain with such reflections as these i was endeavouring to console myself as I plodded home from the fields one cold, damp, cloudy evening, towards the close of October. But the gleam of a bright red fire through the parlour window had more effect in cheering my spirits and rebuking my thankless repinings than all the sage reflections and good resolutions I had forced my mind to frame. For I was young then, remember only four and twenty, and had not acquired half the rule over my own spirit that I now possess, trifling as that may be. However, that haven of bliss must not be entered till I had exchanged my miry boots for a clean pair of shoes, and my rough surtout for a respectable coat, and made myself generally presentable before decent society, for my mother, with all her kindness, was vastly particular on certain points. In ascending to my room, I was met upon the stairs by a smart, pretty girl of nineteen, with a tidy, dumpy figure, a round face, bright, blooming cheeks, 
glossy clustering curls, and little merry brown eyes. I need not tell you this was my sister Rose. She is, I know, a comely matron still, and doubtless no less lovely, in your eyes, than on the happy day you first beheld her. Nothing told me then that she, a few years hence, would be the wife of one entirely unknown to me as yet, but destined hereafter to become a closer friend than even herself, more intimate than that unmannerly lad of seventeen, by whom I was collared in the passage, on coming down, and well nigh jerked off my equilibrium, and who in correction for his impudence received a resounding whack over the sconce, which, however, sustained no serious injury from the infliction, as besides being more than commonly thick, it was protected by a redundant shock of short reddish curls that my mother called Auburn. On entering the parlour we found that honoured lady seated in her armchair at the fireside, working away at her knitting, according to her usual custom, when she had nothing else to do. She had swept the hearth and made a bright blazing fire for our reception. The servant had just brought in the tea tray, and Rose was producing the sugar basin and tea caddy from the cupboard in the black oak sideboard that shone like polished ebony in the cheerful parlour twilight. "'Well, here they both are,' cried my mother, looking round upon us without retarding the motion of her nimble fingers and littering needles. "'Now shut the door and come to the fire while Rose gets the tea ready. I'm sure you must be starved. And tell me what you've been about all day. I'd like to know what my children have been about.' "'I've been breaking in the grey coat. No easy business, that. Directing the ploughing of the last wheat stubble, for the ploughboy has not the sense to direct himself, and carry out a plan for the extensive and efficient draining of the low meadowlands. That's my brave boy. And, Fergus, what have you been doing? Butcher baiting. And here he proceeded to give a particular account of his sport, and the respective traits of prowess evinced by the badger and the dogs. My mother pretending to listen with deep attention, and watching his animated countenance, with a degree of maternal admiration, I thought highly disproportioned to its object. "'It's time you should be doing something else, Fergus,' said I, as soon as a momentary pause in his narration allowed me to get in a word. "'What can I do?' replied he. "'My mother won't let me go to sea or enter the army, and I'm determined to do nothing else, except make myself such a nuisance to you all that you will be thankful to get rid of me on any terms.' Our parent soothingly stroked his stiff, short curls. He growled, and tried to look sulky, and then we all took our seats at the table, in obedience to the thrice-repeated summons of Rose. "'Now take your tea,' said she. "'And I'll tell you what I've been doing. I've been to call on the Wilsons, and it's a thousand pities you didn't go with me, Gilbert, for Eliza Millward was there.' "'Well, what of her?' "'Oh, nothing. I'm not going to tell you about her.' only that she's a nice, amusing little thing, when she is in a merry humour, and I shouldn't mind calling her. Hush, hush, my dear. Your brother has no such idea, whispered my mother earnestly, holding up her finger. Well, resumed Rose, I was going to tell you an important piece of news I heard there. I have been bursting with it ever since. You know, it was reported a month ago that somebody was going to take Wildfell Hall, and, what do you think, it has actually been inhabited above a week, and we never knew. Impossible, cried my mother. Preposterous, shrieked Fergus. It has indeed, and by a single lady. Good gracious, my dear, the place is in ruins. She has had two or three rooms made habitable, and there she lives all alone, except an old woman for a servant. Oh, dear, that spoils it. I'd hoped she was a witch, observed Fergus, while carving his inch-thick slice of bread and butter. Nonsense, Fergus. But isn't it strange, Mamma? Strange? I can hardly believe it. But you may believe it, for Jane Wilson has seen her. She went with her mother, who, of course, when she heard of a stranger being in the neighbourhood, would be on pins and needles till she had seen her and got all she could out of her. She is called Mrs. Graham, and she is in mourning. Not widow's weeds, but slightish mourning. And she is quite young, they say, not above five or six and twenty, but so reserved. 
They tried all they could to find out who she was and where she came from, and all about her, but neither Mrs. Wilson, with her pertinacious and impertinent home thrusts, nor Miss Wilson, with her skilful manoeuvring, could manage to elicit a single satisfactory answer, or even a casual remark, or chance expression calculated to allay their curiosity, or throw the faintest ray of light upon her history, circumstances, or connections. Moreover, she was barely civil to them, and evidently better pleased to say good-bye than how do you do. But Eliza Millward says her father intends to call upon her soon, to offer some pastoral advice, which he fears she needs, as, though she is known to have entered the neighbourhood early last week, she did not make her appearance at church on Sunday, and she, Eliza, that is, will beg to accompany him, and is sure she can succeed in wheedling something out of her. You know, Gilbert, she can do anything. And we should call some time, Mamma. It's only proper, you know. Of course, my dear. Poor thing, how lonely she must feel. And pray be quick about it. And mind you, bring me word how much sugar she puts in her tea, and what sort of caps and aprons she wears, and all about it, for I don't know how I can live till I know, said Fergus, very gravely. But if he intended the speech to be hailed as a master stroke of wit, he signally failed, for nobody laughed. However, he was not much disconcerted at that, for when he had taken a mouthful of bread and butter, and was about to swallow a gulp of tea, the humour of the thing burst upon him with such irresistible force that he was obliged to jump up from the table and rush snorting and choking from the room, and a minute after was heard screaming in fearful agony in the garden. As for me, I was hungry, and contented myself with silently demolishing the tea, ham and toast while well, my mother and sister went on talking, and continued to discuss the apparent or non-apparent circumstances and probable or improbable history of the mysterious lady. But I must confess that, after my brother's misadventure, I once or twice raised the cup to my lips, and put it down again without daring to taste the contents, lest I should injure my dignity by a similar explosion. The next day my mother and Rose hastened to pay their compliments to the fair recluse, and came back but little wiser than they went, though my mother declared she did not regret the journey, for if she had not gained much good, she flattered herself she had imparted some, and that was better. She had given some useful advice which she hoped would not be thrown away, for Mrs. Graham, though she said little to any purpose, and appeared somewhat self-opinionated seemed not incapable of reflection, though she did not know where she had been all her life, poor thing, for she betrayed a lamentable ignorance on certain points, and had not even the sense to be ashamed of it. On what points, mother? asked I. On household matters, and all the little niceties of cookery, and such things, that every lady ought to be familiar with, whether she be required to make a practical use of her knowledge or not. I gave her some useful pieces of information, however, and several excellent receipts, the value of which she evidently could not appreciate, for she begged I would not trouble myself, as she lived in such a plain, quiet way, that she was sure she should never make use of them. No matter, my dear, said I, it is what every respectable female ought to know. And besides, though you are alone now, you will not be always so. You have been married, and probably, I might say almost certainly, will be again." "'You are mistaken there, ma'am,' said she, almost haughtily. "'I am certain I never shall. "'But I told her I knew better.' "'Some romantic young widow, I suppose,' said I, "'come there to end her days in solitude, "'and mourn in secret for the dear departed. "'But it won't last long.' "'No, I think not,' observed Rose. "'For well, she didn't seem very disconsolate, after all, "'and she's excessively pretty, handsome, rather.' You must see her, Gilbert. You will call her a perfect beauty, though you could hardly pretend to discover a resemblance between her and Eliza Millward. Well, I can imagine many faces more beautiful than Eliza's, though not more charming. I allow she has small claims to perfection, but then I maintain that if she were more perfect, she would be less interesting. And so you prefer her faults to other people's perfections? Just so, saving my mother's presence. Oh, my dear Gilbert, what nonsense you talk. I know you don't mean it. It's quite out of the question, said my mother, getting up and 
bustling out of the room, under pretense of household business, in order to escape the contradiction that was trembling on my tongue. After that Rose favoured me with further particulars respecting Mrs. Graham, her appearance, manners, and dress, and the very furniture of the room she inhabited, were all set before me with rather more clearness and precision than I cared to see them. But as I was not a very attentive listener, I could not repeat the description if I would. The next day was Saturday, and on Sunday everybody wondered whether or not the fair unknown would profit by the vicar's remonstrance and come to church. I confess I looked with some interest myself towards the old family pew appertaining to Wildfell Hall, where the faded crimson cushions and lining had been unpressed and unrenewed so many years, and the grim escutcheons with their lugubrious borders of rusty black cloth frowned so sternly from the wall above, and there I beheld a tall, ladylike figure clad in black. Her face was towards me, and there was something in it which, once seen, invited me to look again. Her hair was raven black, and disposed in long glossy ringlets, a style of coiffure rather unusual in those days, but always graceful and becoming. Her complexion was clear and pale. Her eyes I could not see, for being bent upon her prayer book, they were concealed by their drooping lids and long black lashes, but the brows above were expressive and well defined. The forehead was lofty and intellectual, the nose a perfect aquiline and the features in general unexceptional, only there was a slight hollowness about the cheeks and eyes, and the lips, though finely formed, were a little too thin, a little too firmly compressed, and a something about them that betokened, I thought, no very soft or amiable temper. And I said in my heart, I would rather admire you from this distance, fair lady, than be the partner of your home. Just then she happened to raise her eyes, and they met mine. I did not choose to withdraw my gaze, and she turned again to her book, but with that momentary, indefinable expression of quiet scorn that was inexpressibly provoking to me. She thinks me an impudent puppy, thought I. Hm. She shall change her mind before long, if I think it worth while. But then it flashed upon me that these were very improper thoughts for a place of worship, and that my behaviour on the present occasion was anything but what it ought to be. Previous, however, to directing my mind to the service, I glanced round the church to see if any one had been observing me. But no, all who were not attending to their prayer books were attending to the strange lady, my good mother and sister among the rest, and Mrs. Wilson and her daughter, and even Eliza Millward was slyly glancing from the corners of her eyes towards the object of general attraction. Then she glanced at me, simpered a little, and blushed modestly looked at her prayer book, and endeavoured to compose her features. Here I was transgressing again, and this time I was made sensible of it by a sudden dig in the ribs, from the elbow of my pert brother. For the present I could only resent the insult by pressing my foot upon his toes, deferring further vengeance till we got out of church. Now, Halford, before I close this letter, I'll tell you who Eliza Millward was. She was the vicar's younger daughter and a very engaging little creature, for whom I felt no small degree of partiality, and she knew it, though I had never come to any direct explanation, and had no definite intention of so doing, for my mother, who maintained there was no one good enough for me within twenty miles round, could not bear the thoughts of my marrying that insignificant little thing, who, in addition to her numerous other disqualifications, had not twenty pounds to call her own. Eliza's figure was at once slight and plump, her face small, and nearly as round as my sister's, complexion something similar to hers but more delicate, and less decidedly blooming, nose retroussé, features generally irregular, and altogether she was rather charming than pretty. But her eyes! I must not forget those remarkable features, for therein her chief attraction lay. In outward aspect at least, they were long and narrow in shape, the iris is black or very dark brown, the expression various and ever-changing, but always either preternaturally, I had almost said diabolically wicked, or irresistibly bewitching, often both. Her voice was gentle and childish, her tread light and soft as that of a cat, 
but her manners more frequently resembled those of a pretty, playful kitten, that is now pert and roguish, now timid and demure, according to its own sweet will. Her sister Mary was several years older, several inches taller, and of a larger, coarser build, a plain, quiet, sensible girl, who had patiently nursed their mother through her last long tedious illness, and being the housekeeper and family drudge from thence to the present time, she was trusted and valued by her father, loved and courted by all dogs, cats, children, and poor people, and slighted and neglected by everybody else. The Reverend Michael Millward himself was a tall, ponderous elderly gentleman, who placed a shovel hat above his large, square, massive-featured face, carried a stout walking-stick in his hand, and encased his still powerful limbs in knee-breeches and gaiters, or black silk stockings on state occasions. He was a man of fixed principles, strong prejudices, and regular habits, intolerant of dissent in any shape, acting under a firm conviction that his opinions were always right, and whoever differed from them must be either most deplorably ignorant or willfully blind. In childhood, I had always been accustomed to regard him with a feeling of reverential awe, but lately even now surmounted, for, though he had a fatherly kindness for the well-behaved, he was a strict disciplinarian, and had often sternly reproved our juvenile failings and peccadilloes, and moreover, in those days, whenever he called upon our parents, we had to stand up before him and say our catechism, or repeat, How doth the little busy be, or some other hymn, or worse than all, be questioned about his last text and the heads of the discourse, which we never could remember. Sometimes the worthy gentleman would reprove my mother for being over-indulgent to her sons, with a reference to old Eli or David and Absalom, which was particularly galling to her feelings, and very highly as she respected him and all his sayings, I once heard her exclaim, I wish to goodness he had a son himself. He wouldn't be so ready with his advice to other people then. He'd see what it is to have a couple of boys to keep in order. He had a laudable care for his own bodily health, kept very early hours, regularly took a walk before breakfast, was vastly particular about warm and dry clothing, had never been known to preach a sermon without previously swallowing a raw egg, albeit he was gifted with good lungs and a powerful voice, and was generally extremely particular about what he ate and drank, though by no means abstemious, and having a mode of dietary peculiar to himself being a great despiser of tea and such slops, and a patron of malt liqueurs, bacon and eggs, ham, hung beef, and other strong meats, which agreed well enough with his digestive organs, and therefore were maintained by him to be good and wholesome for everybody, and confidently recommended to the most delicate convalescents or dyspeptics, who, if they failed to derive the promised benefit from his prescriptions, were told it was because they had not persevered and if they complained of inconvenient results therefrom, were assured it was all fancy. I will just touch upon two other persons whom I have mentioned, and then bring this long letter to a close. These are Mrs. Wilson and her daughter. The former was the widow of a substantial farmer, a narrow-minded, tattling old gossip, whose character is not worth describing. She had two sons, Robert, a rough, countrified farmer, and Richard, a retiring, studious young man who was studying the classics with the vicar's assistance, preparing for college with a view to enter the church. Their sister Jane was a young lady of some talents and more ambition. She had, at her own desire, received a regular boarding-school education, superior to what any member of the family had obtained before. She had taken the polish well, acquired considerable elegance of manners, quite lost her provincial accent, and could boast of more accomplishments than the vicar's daughters. She was considered a beauty besides, but never for a moment could she number me amongst her admirers. She was about six and twenty, rather tall and very slender. Her hair was neither chestnut nor auburn, but a most decided bright light red. Her complexion was remarkably fair and brilliant, her head small, neck long, chin well turned, but very short, lips thin and red, eyes clear, hazel, quick and penetrating, but entirely destitute of poetry or feeling. She had, or might have had, many suitors in her own rank of life, but scornfully repulsed or rejected them all. For none but a gentleman could please her refined taste, and none but a rich one could satisfy her soaring ambition. One gentleman there was, 
for whom she had lately received some rather pointed attentions, and upon whose heart, name, and fortune it was whispered she had serious designs. This was Mr. Lawrence, the young squire, whose family had formerly occupied Wildfell Hall, but had deserted it some fifteen years ago, for a more modern and commodious mansion in the neighbouring parish. Now, Halford, I bid you adieu for the present. This is the first instalment of my debt. If the coin suits you, tell me so, and I'll send you the rest at my leisure. If you would rather remain my creditor than stuff your purse with such ungainly heavy pieces, tell me still, and I'll pardon your bad taste, and willingly keep the treasure to myself. Yours immutably, Gilbert Markham. End of chapter 1《Of the Tenant of Wildfell Hall》by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I perceive with joy, my most valued friend, that the cloud of your displeasure has passed away. The light of your countenance blesses me once more, and you desire the continuation of my story. Therefore, without more ado, you shall have it. I think the day I last mentioned was a certain Sunday. The latest in the October of 1827. On the following Tuesday I was out with my dog and gun, in pursuit of such game as I could find within the territory of Linden Carr. But finding none at all, I turned my arms against a hawks and carrion crows, whose depredations, as I suspected, had deprived me of better prey. To this end I left the more frequented regions, the wooded valleys, the cornfields, and the meadowlands, and proceeded to mount the steep acclivity of Wildfell, the wildest and the loftiest eminence in our neighbourhood, where, as you ascend, the hedges, as well as the trees, become scanty and stunted, the former at length giving place to rough stone fences, partly greened over with ivy and moss, the latter to larches and Scots fir trees, or isolated blackthorns. The fields being rough and stony, and wholly unfit for the plough, were mostly devoted to the pasturing of sheep and cattle. The soil was thin and poor. Bits of grey rock here and there peeped out from the grassy hillocks. Bilberry plants and heather, relics of more savage wildness, grew under the walls, and in many of the enclosures ragweeds and rushes usurped supremacy over the scanty herbage. But these were not my property. Near the top of this hill, about two miles from Linden Carr, stood Wildfell Hall, a superannuated mansion of the Elizabethan era, built of dark grey stone, venerable and picturesque to look at, but doubtless cold and gloomy enough to inhabit, with its thick stone mullions and little latticed panels, its time-eaten air-holes, and its too lonely, too unsheltered situation, only shielded from the war of wind and weather by a group of Scots firs, themselves half blighted with storms, and looking as stern and gloomy as the hall itself. Behind it lay a few desolate fields, and then the brown heath-clad summit of the hill. Before it, enclosed by stone walls, and entered by an iron gate, with large balls of grey granite, similar to those which decorated the roof and gables, surmounting the gate-posts, was a garden, once stocked with such hard plants and flowers as could best brook the soil and climate, and such trees and shrubs as could best endure the gardener's torturing shears and most readily assume the shapes he chose to give them. Now, having been left so many years untilled and untrimmed, abandoned to the weeds and the grass, to the frost and the wind, the rain and the drought, it presented a very singular appearance indeed. The close green walls of privet that had bordered the principal walk were two-thirds withered away, and the rest grown beyond all reasonable bounds. The old boxwood swan that sat beside the scraper had lost its neck and half its body, the castellated towers of laurel in the middle of the garden, the gigantic warrior that stood on one side of the gateway, and the lion that guarded the other, were sprouted into such fantastic shapes as resembled nothing either in heaven or earth, or in the waters under the earth. But, to my young imagination, they presented all of them a goblinish appearance that harmonised well with the ghostly legions and dark traditions our old nurse had told us respecting the haunted hall and its departed occupants. I had succeeded in killing a hawk and two crows, when I came within sight of the mansion, and then, relinquishing further depredations, I sauntered on, to have a look at the old place, and see what 
changes had been wrought in it by its new inhabitant. I did not like to go quite to the front and stare in at the gate, but I paused beside the garden wall and looked, and saw no change, except in one wing, where the broken windows and dilapidated roof had evidently been repaired, and where a thin wreath of smoke was curling up from the stack of chimneys. While I thus stood, leaning on my gun, and looking up at the dark gables, sunk in an idle reverie, weaving a tissue of wayward fancies, in which old associations and the fair young hermit, now within those walls, bore a nearly equal part. I heard a slight rustling and scrambling just within the garden, and glancing in the direction whence the sound proceeded, I beheld a tiny hand elevated above the wall. It clung to the topmost stone, and then another little hand was raised to take a firmer hold, and then appeared a small white forehead, surmounted with wreaths of light brown hair, with a pair of deep blue eyes beneath, and the upper portion of a diminutive ivory nose. The eyes did not notice me, but sparkled with glee on beholding Sancho, my beautiful black and white setter, that was coursing about the field with its muzzle to the ground. The little creature raised its face and called aloud to the dog. The good-natured animal paused, looked up, and wagged his tail, but made no further advances. The child, the little boy, apparently about five years old, scrambled up to the top of the wall, and called again and again, but finding this of no avail, apparently made up his mind like Mohammed to go to the mountain since the mountain would not come to him, and attempted to get over, but a crabbed old cherry tree that grew hard by caught him by the frock in one of its crooked scraggy arms that stretched over the wall. In attempting to disengage himself his foot slipped, and down he tumbled, but not to the earth. The tree still kept him suspended. There was a silent struggle, and then a piercing shriek, but in an instant I had dropped my gun on the grass, and caught the little fellow in my arms. I wiped his eyes with his frock, told him he was all right, and called Sancho to pacify him. He was just putting little hand on the dog's neck, and beginning to smile through his tears, when I heard behind me a click of the iron gate, and a rustle of female garments, and lo, Mrs. Graham darted upon me, her neck uncovered, her black lock streaming in the wind. "'Give me the child,' she said, in a voice scarce louder than a whisper, and with a tone of startling vehemence and seizing the boy, she snatched him from me, as if some dire contamination were in my touch, and then stood with one hand firmly clasping his, the other on his shoulder, fixing upon me her large, luminous dark eyes, pale, breathless, quivering with agitation. "'I was not harming the child, madam,' said I, scarce knowing whether to be most astonished or displeased. He was tumbling off the wall there, and I was so fortunate as to catch him while he hung suspended headlong from that tree and prevent I know not what catastrophe. I beg your pardon, sir, stammered she, suddenly calming down, the light of reason seeming to break upon her beclouded spirit, and a faint blush mantling on her cheek. I did not know you, and I thought— She stooped to kiss the child, and fondly clasped her arm round his neck. You thought I was going to kidnap your son, I suppose. She stroked his head with a half-embarrassed laugh, and replied— I did not know he had attempted to climb the wall. I have the pleasure of addressing Mr. Markham, I believe," she added, somewhat abruptly. I bowed, but ventured to ask how she knew me. Your sister called here, a few days ago, with Mrs. Markham. Is resemblance so strong, then? I asked, in some surprise, and not so greatly flattered at the idea as I ought to have been. There is a likeness about the eyes and complexion, I think," replied she somewhat dubiously surveying my face. And I think I saw you at church on Sunday. I smiled. There was something either in that smile or the recollections it awakened that was particularly displeasing to her, for she suddenly assumed again that proud chilly look that had so unspeakably roused my aversion at church, a look of repellent scorn, so easily assumed, and so entirely without the least distortion of a single feature that while there it seemed like the natural expression of the face, and was the more provoking to me because I could not think it affected. "'Good morning, Mr. Markham,' said she, and without another word or glance she withdrew, with her child, into the garden, and I returned home, angry and dissatisfied. 
I can scarcely tell you why, and therefore will not attempt it. I only stay to put away my gun and powder horn, and give some requisite directions to one of the farming men, and then repaired to the vicarage, to solace my spirit and soothe my ruffled temper with the company and conversation of Eliza Millwood. I found her, as usual, busy with some piece of soft embroidery. The mania for Berlin wools had not yet commenced, while her sister was seated at the chimney corner, with a cat on her knee, mending a heap of stockings. Mary, Mary, put them away! Eliza was hastily saying, just as I entered the room. Not I, indeed, was the phlegmatic reply, and my appearance prevented further discussion. You're so unfortunate, Mr. Markham, observed the younger sister, with one of her arch, sidelong glances. Papa's just gone out into the parish, and not likely to be back for an hour. Never mind. I can manage to spend a few minutes with his daughters, if they'll allow me, said I, bringing a chair to the fire, and seating myself therein, without waiting to be asked. Well, if you'll be very good and amusing, we shall not object. Let your permission be unconditional, pray, for I came not to give pleasure, but to seek it, I answered. However, I thought it but reasonable to make some slight exertion to render my company agreeable, and what little effort I made was apparently pretty successful, for Miss Eliza was never in a better humour. We seemed indeed to be mutually pleased with each other, and managed to maintain between us a cheerful and animated, though not very profound, conversation. It was little better than a tete-a-tete, -tete, for Miss Millward never opened her lips, except occasionally to correct some random assertion or exaggerated expression of her sister's, and once to ask her to pick up the ball of cotton that had rolled under the table. I did this myself, however, as in duty bound. Thank you, Mr. Markham, said she, as I presented it to her. I would have picked it up myself, only I did not want to disturb the cats. Mary, dear, that won't excuse you in Mr. Markham's eyes, said Eliza. He hates cats, I dare say, as cordially as he does old maids, like all other gentlemen. Don't you, Mr. Markham? I believe it is natural for our unamiable sex to dislike the creatures, replied I, for you ladies lavish so many caresses upon them. Bless them, little darlings, cried she, in a sudden burst of enthusiasm, turning round and overwhelming her sister's pet with a shower of kisses. Don't, Eliza, said Miss Millward, somewhat gruffly, as she impatiently pushed her away. But it was time for me to be going. Make what haste I would, I should still be too late for tea, and my mother was the soul of order and punctuality. My fair friend was evidently unwilling to bid me adieu. I tenderly squeezed a little hand at parting, and she repaid me with one of her softest smiles and most bewitching glances. I went home very happy, with the heart brimful of complacency for myself, and overflowing with love for Eliza. End of chapter 2《Of the Tenant of Wildfell Hall》by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two days after, Mrs. Graham called at Linden Carr. Contrary to the expectation of Rose, who entertained an idea that the mysterious occupant of Wildfell Hall would wholly disregard the common observances of civilized life, in which opinion she was supported by the Wilsons, who testified that neither their call nor the Millwards had been returned as yet. Now, however, the cause of that omission was explained, though not entirely to the satisfaction of Rose. Mrs. Graham had brought her child with her, and on my mother's expressing surprise that he could walk so far, she replied, It is a long walk for him, but I must have either taken him with me, or relinquished the visit altogether, for I never leave him alone. And I think, Mrs. Markham, I must beg you to make my excuses to the Millwards and Mrs. Wilson, when you see them, as I fear I cannot do myself the pleasure of calling upon them till my little Arthur is able to accompany me. But you have a servant, said Rose. Could you not leave him with her? She has her own occupations to attend to, and besides, she is too old to run after a child, and he is too mercurial to be tied to an elderly woman. But you left him to come to church. Yes, once but I would not have left him for any other purpose, and I think, in future, I must contrive to bring him with me, or stay at home. Is he so mischievous? 
asked my mother, considerably shocked. No, replied the lady, sadly smiling, as she stroked the wavy locks of her son, who was seated on a low stool at her feet. But he is my only treasure, and I am his only friend, so we don't like to be separated. But, my dear, I call that doting, said my plain-spoken parent. You should try to suppress such foolish fondness, as well to save your son from ruin as yourself from ridicule. Ruin? Mrs. Markham! Yes, it is spoiling the child. Even at his age he ought not to be always tied to his mother's apron-string. He should learn to be ashamed of it. Mrs. Markham, I beg you will not say such things, in his presence at least. I trust my son will never be ashamed to love his mother. Said Mrs. Graham, with a serious energy that startled the company. My mother attempted to appease her by an explanation, but she seemed to think enough had been said on the subject, and abruptly turned the conversation. Just as I thought, said I to myself, the lady's temper is none of the mildest, notwithstanding her sweet pale face and lofty brow, where thought and suffering seem equally to have stamped their impress. All this time I was seated at the table on the other side of the room, apparently immersed in the perusal of a volume of the Farmer's Magazine, which I happened to have been reading at the moment of our visitor's arrival, and not choosing to be over-civil, I had merely bowed as she entered, and continued my occupation as before. In a little while, however, I was sensible that someone was approaching me, with a light but slow and hesitating tread. It was little Arthur, irresistibly attracted by my dog Sancho, that was lying at my feet. On looking up, I beheld him standing about two yards off, with his clear blue eyes wistfully gazing on the dog, transfixed to the spot, not by fear of the animal, but by a timid disinclination to approach its master. A little encouragement, however, induced him to come forward. The child, though shy, was not sullen. In a minute he was kneeling on the carpet with his arms round Sancho's neck, and in a minute or two more the little fellow was seated on my knee, surveying with eager interest the various specimens of horses, cattle, pigs, and model farms portrayed in the volume before me. I glanced at his mother now and then to see how she relished the new-sprung intimacy, and I saw, by the unquiet aspect of her eye, that for some reason or other she was uneasy at the child's position. Arthur, said she at length, come here. You are troublesome to Mr. Markham. He wishes to read. By no means, Mrs. Graham. Pray let him stay. I am as much amused as he is pleaded I, but still, with hand and eye, she silently called him to her side. Now, mamma, said the child, let me look at these pictures first, and then I'll come and tell you all about them. We are going to have a small party on Monday, the 5th of November, said my mother, and I hope you will not refuse to make one, Mrs. Graham. You can bring your little boy with you, you know. I dare say we shall be able to amuse him, and then you can make your own apologies to the Millwards and Wilsons. They will all be here, I expect. Thank you. I never go to parties. Oh, but this will be quite a family concern. Early hours, and nobody here but ourselves, and just the Millwards and Wilsons, most of whom you already know, and Mr. Lawrence, your landlord, with whom you ought to make acquaintance. I do know something of him, but you must excuse me this time, for the evenings now are dark and damp, and Arthur, I fear, is too delicate to risk exposure to their influence with impunity. We must defer the enjoyment of your hospitality to the return of longer days and warmer nights. Rose now, at a hint from my mother, produced a decanter of wine, with accompaniments of glasses and cake, from the cupboard and the oak sideboard, and the refreshment was duly presented to the guests. They both partook of the cake, but obstinately refused the wine, in spite of their hostess's hospitable attempts to force it upon them. Arthur especially shrank from the ruby nectar, as if in terror and disgust and was ready to cry when urged to take it. "'Never mind, Arthur,' said his mamma. "'Mrs. Markham thinks it will do you good, as you were tired with your walk. But she will not oblige you to take it. I dare say you will do very well without. He detests the very sight of wine,' she added, "'and the smell of it almost makes him sick. I have been accustomed to make him swallow a little wine or weak spirits and water, by way of medicine, when he was sick, and, in fact, I have done what I could to make him hate them.' Everybody laughed, except the young widow and her son. Well, Mrs. Graham, said my mother, wiping the tears of merriment from her bright blue eyes. Well, you surprise me. I really gave you credit for having more sense. 
the poor child will be the veriest milksop that ever was sopped only think what a man you will make of him if you persist in i think it a very excellent plan interrupted mrs graham with imperturbable gravity by that means i hope to save him from one degrading vice at least i wish i could render the incentives to every other equally obnoxious in his case but by such means said i you will never render him virtuous what is it that constitutes virtue mrs graham is it the circumstance of being able and willing to resist temptation or that of having no temptations to resist is he a strong man that overcomes great obstacles and performs surprising achievements though by dint of great muscular exertion and at the risk of some subsequent fatigue or he that sits in his chair all day with nothing to do more laborious than stirring the fire and carrying his food to his mouth if you would have your son to walk honourably through the world you must not attempt to clear the stones from his path but teach him to walk firmly over them not insist upon leading him by the hand but let him learn to go alone i will lead him by the hand mr markham till he has strength to go alone and i will clear as many stones from his path as i can and teach him to avoid the rest or walk firmly over them as you say for when i have done my utmost in the way of clearance there will still be plenty left to exercise all the agility steadiness and circumspection he will ever have it is all very well to talk about noble resistance and trials of virtue but for fifty or five hundred men that have yielded to temptation show me one that has had virtue to resist and why should i take it for granted that my son will be one in a thousand and not rather prepare for the worst and suppose he will be like his like the rest of mankind unless i take care to prevent it you are very complimentary to us all i observed i know nothing about you i speak of those i do know and when i see the whole race of mankind with a few rare exceptions stumbling and blundering along the path of life sinking into every pitfall and breaking their shins over every impediment that lies in their way shall i not use all the means in my power to ensure for him a smoother and safer passage yes but the surest means will be to endeavour to fortify him against temptation not to remove it out of his way i will do both mr markham god knows he will have temptations enough to assail him both from within and without when i have done all i can to render vice as inviting to him as it is abominable in its own nature i myself have had indeed but few incentives to what the world calls vice but yet i have experienced temptations and trials of another kind that have required on many occasions more watchfulness and firmness to resist than i have hitherto been able to muster against them and this i believe is what most others would acknowledge who are accustomed to reflection and wishful to strive against their natural corruptions yes said my mother but half apprehending her drift but you would not judge of a boy by yourself and my dear mrs graham let me warn you in good time against the error the fatal error i may call it of taking that boy's education upon yourself because you are clever in some things and well informed you may fancy yourself equal to the task but indeed you are not and if you persist in the attempt believe me you will bitterly repent it when the mischief is done i am to send him to school i suppose to learn to despise his mother's authority and affection said the lady with rather a bitter smile oh no but if you would have a boy to despise his mother let her keep him at home and spend her life in petting him up and slaving to indulge his follies and caprices i perfectly agree with you mrs markham but nothing can be further from my principles and practice than such criminal weakness as that well but you will treat him like a girl you'll spoil his spirit and make a mere miss nancy of him you will indeed mrs graham whatever you may think but i'll get mr millward to talk to you about it he'll tell you the consequences he'll set it before you as plain as the day and tell you what you ought to do and all about it and i don't doubt he'll be able to convince you in a minute no occasion to trouble the vicar said mrs graham glancing at me i suppose i was smiling at my mother's unbounded confidence in that worthy gentleman mr markham here thinks his powers of conviction at least equal to mr millward's if i hear not him neither should i be convinced though one rose from the dead he would tell you well mr markham you that maintain that a boy should not be shielded from evil but sent out to battle against it alone and unassisted not taught to avoid the snares of life 
but boldly to rush into them, or over them, as he may, to seek danger, rather than shun it, and feed his virtue by temptation. Would you— I beg your pardon, Mrs. Graham, but you get on too fast. I have not yet said that a boy should be taught to rush into the snares of life, or even willfully to seek temptation for the sake of exercising his virtue by overcoming it. I only say that it is better to arm and strengthen your hero than to disarm and enfeeble the foe. And if you were to rear an oak sapling in a hothouse, tending it carefully night and day, and shielding it from every breath of wind, you could not expect it to become a hardy tree, like that which has grown up on the mountainside, exposed to all the action of the elements, and not even sheltered from the shock of the tempest. Granted. But would you use the same argument with regard to a girl? Certainly not. No. You would have her to be tenderly and delicately nurtured, like a hothouse plant, taught to cling to others for direction and support, and guarded, as much as possible, from the very knowledge of evil. But will you be so good as to inform me why you make this distinction? Is it that you think she has no virtue? Assuredly not. Well, but you affirm that virtue is only elicited by temptation, and you think that a woman cannot be too little exposed to temptation, or too little acquainted with vice, or anything connected therewith. It must be either that you think she is essentially so vicious, or so feeble-minded, that she cannot withstand temptation, and though she may be pure and innocent as long as she is kept in ignorance and restraint, yet, being destitute of real virtue, to teach her how to sin is at once to make her a sinner, and the greater her knowledge, the wider her liberty, the deeper will be her depravity. Whereas, in the nobler sex, there is a natural tendency to goodness, guarded by a superior fortitude, which, the more it is exercised by trials and dangers, is only the further developed. Heaven forbid that I should think so, I interrupted her at last. Well, then, it must be that you think they are both weak and prone to err, and the slightest error, the merest shadow of pollution, will ruin the one, while the character of the other will be strengthened and embellished, his education properly finished by a little practical acquaintance with forbidden things. Such experience, to him, to use a trite simile, will be like the storm to the oak, which, though it may scatter the leaves, and snap the smaller branches, serves but to rivet the roots, and to harden and condense the fibres of the tree. You would have us encourage our sons to prove all things by their own experience, while our daughters must not even profit by the experience of others. Now I would have both so to benefit by the experience of others, and the precepts of a higher authority, that they should know beforehand to refuse the evil, and choose the good, and require no experimental proofs to teach them the evil of transgression. I would not send a poor girl into the world, unarmed against her foes, and ignorant of the snares that beset her path. Nor would I watch and guard her, till, deprived of self-respect and self-reliance, she lost the power or the will to watch and guard herself. And as for my son, if I thought he would grow up to be what you call a man of the world, one that has seen life, and glories in his experience, even though he should so far profit by it as to sober down, at length, into a useful and respected member of society, I would rather that he died to-morrow, rather a thousand times. She earnestly repeated, pressing her darling to her side, and kissing his forehead with intense affection. He had already left his new companion, and been standing for some time beside his mother's knee, looking up into her face, and listening in silent wonder to her incomprehensible discourse. "'Well, you ladies must always have the last word, I suppose,' said I, observing her rise and begin to take leave of my mother. "'You may have as many words as you please, only I can't stay to hear them.' "'No, that is the way. You hear just as much of an argument as you please, and the rest may be spoken to the wind.' "'If you are anxious to say anything more on the subject,' replied she, as she shook hands with Rose, "'you must bring your sister to see me some fine day, and I'll listen, as patiently as you could wish, to whatever you please to say. I would rather be lectured by you than the vicar, because I should have less remorse in telling you, at the end of the discourse, that I preserve my own opinion precisely the same as at the beginning, as would be the case, I am persuaded, with regard to either logician.' "'Yes, of course,' replied I, determined to be as provoking as herself. For when a lady does consent to listen to an argument against her own opinions, she is always predetermined to withstand it, 
to listen only with her bodily ears, keeping the mental organs resolutely closed against the strongest reasoning. "'Good morning, Mr. Markham,' said my fair antagonist, with a pitying smile, and deigning no further rejoinder, she slightly bowed, and was about to withdraw, but her son, with childish impertinence, arrested her by exclaiming, "'Mamma, you have not shaken hands with Mr. Markham.' She laughingly turned round, and held out her hand. I gave it a spiteful squeeze, for I was annoyed at the continual injustice she had done me from the very dawn of our acquaintance. Without knowing anything about my real disposition and principles, she was evidently prejudiced against me, and seemed bent upon showing me that her opinions respecting me on every particular fell far below those I had entertained of myself. I was naturally touchy, or it would not have vexed me so much. Perhaps, too, I was a little bit spoiled by my mother and sister, and some other ladies of my acquaintance, and yet I was by no means a fop. Of that I am fully convinced, whether you are or not. End of chapter 3「Of the Tenant of Wildfell Hall » by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Our party on the 5th of November passed off very well, in spite of Mrs. Graham's refusal to grace it with her presence. Indeed, it is probable that, had she been there, there would have been less cordiality, freedom and frolic amongst us than there was without her. My mother, as usual, was cheerful and chatty full of activity and good nature, and only faulty in being too anxious to make her guests happy, thereby forcing several of them to do what their soul abhorred in the way of eating or drinking, sitting opposite the blazing fire, or talking when they would be silent. Nevertheless, they bore it very well, being all in their holiday humours. Mr. Millward was mighty in important dogmas and sententious jokes, pompous anecdotes and oracular discourses dealt out for the edification of the whole assembly in general, and of the admiring Mrs. Markham, the polite Mr. Lawrence, and the sedate Mary Millward, the quiet Richard Wilson, and the matter-of-fact Robert in particular, as being the most attentive listeners. Mrs. Wilson was more brilliant than ever, with her budgets of fresh news and old scandal, strung together with trivial questions and remarks, and oft-repeated observations, uttered apparently for the sole purpose of denying a moment's rest to her inexhaustible organs of speech. She had brought her knitting with her, and it seemed as if her tongue had laid a wager with her fingers to outdo them in swift and ceaseless motion. Her daughter Jane was, of course, as graceful and elegant, as witty and seductive as she could possibly manage to be, for here were all the ladies to outshine, and all the gentlemen to charm and Mr. Lawrence especially, to capture and subdue. Her little arts to effect his subjugation were too subtle and impalpable to attract my observation, but I thought there was a certain refined affectation of superiority, and an ungenial self-consciousness about her, that negatived all her advantages, and after she was gone, Rose interpreted to me her various looks, words, and actions, with a mingled acuteness and asperity, that made me wonder equally at the lady's artifice and my sister's penetration, and ask myself if she too had an eye to the squire. But never mind, Alfred, she had not. Richard Wilson, Jane's younger brother, sat in the corner, apparently good-tempered, but silent and shy, desirous to escape observation, but willing enough to listen and observe, and although somewhat out of his element, he would have been happy enough in his own quiet way, if my mother could only have let him alone. But in her mistaken kindness, she would keep persecuting him with her attentions, pressing upon him all manner of viands under the notion that he was too bashful to help himself, and obliging him to shout across the room his monosyllabic replies to the numerous questions and observations by which she vainly attempted to draw him into conversation. Rose informed me that he never would have favoured us with his company, but for the importunities of his sister Jane who was most anxious to show Mr. Lawrence that she had at least one brother more gentlemanly and refined than Robert. That worthy individual she had been equally solicitous to keep away, but he affirmed that he saw no reason why he should not enjoy a crack with Markham and the old lady. My mother was not old, really, 
and bonny miss rose and the parson as well as the best and he was in the right of it too so he talked commonplace with my mother and rose and discussed parish affairs with the vicar farming matters with me and politics with us both mary millward was another mute not so much tormented with cruel kindness as dick wilson because she had a certain short decided way of answering and refusing and was supposed to be rather sullen than diffident however that might be she certainly did not give much pleasure to the company nor did she appear to derive much from it eliza told me she had only come because her father insisted upon it having taken it into his head that she devoted herself too exclusively to her household duties to the neglect of such relaxations and innocent enjoyments as were proper to her age and sex she seemed to me to be good-humoured enough on the whole once or twice she was provoked to laughter by the wit or the merriment of some favoured individual amongst us and then i observed she sought the eye of richard wilson who sat over against her as he studied with her father she had some acquaintance with him in spite of the retiring habits of both and i suppose there was a kind of fellow feeling established between them my eliza was charming beyond description coquettish without affectation and evidently more desirous to engage my attention than that of all the room besides her delight in having me near her seated or standing by her side whispering in her ear or pressing her hand in the dance was plainly legible in her glowing face and heaving bosom who ever belied by saucy words and gestures but i had better hold my tongue if i boast of these things now i shall have to blush hereafter to proceed then with the various individuals of our party rose was simple and natural as usual and full of mirth and vivacity fergus was impertinent and absurd but his impertinence and folly served to make others laugh if they did not raise himself in their estimation and finally for i omit myself mr lawrence was gentlemanly and inoffensive to all and polite to the vicar and the ladies especially his hostess and her daughter and miss wilson misguided man he had not the taste to prefer eliza millward mr lawrence and i were on tolerably intimate terms essentially of reserved habits and but seldom quitting the secluded place of his birth where he had lived in solitary state since the death of his father he had neither the opportunity nor the inclination for forming many acquaintances and of all he had ever known i judging by the results was the companion most agreeable to his taste i liked the man well enough but he was too cold and shy and self-contained to obtain my cordial sympathies a spirit of candour and frankness when wholly unaccompanied with coarseness he admired in others but he could not acquire it himself his excessive reserve upon all his own concerns was indeed provoking and chilly enough but i forgave it from a conviction that it originated less in pride and want of confidence in his friends than in a certain morbid feeling of delicacy and a peculiar diffidence that he was sensible of but wanted energy to overcome his heart was like a sensitive plant that opens for a moment in the sunshine but curls up and shrinks into itself at the slightest touch of the finger or the lightest breath of wind and upon the whole our intimacy was rather a mutual predilection than a deep and solid friendship such as has since arisen between myself and you halford whom in spite of your occasional crustiness i can liken to nothing so well as an old coat unimpeachable in texture but easy and loose that has conformed itself to the shape of the wearer and which he may use as he pleases without being bothered with the fear of spoiling it whereas mr lawrence was like a new garment all very neat and trim to look at but so tight in the elbows that you would fear to split the seams by the unrestricted motion of your arms and so smooth and fine in surface that you scruple to expose it to a single drop of rain soon after the arrival of the guests my mother mentioned mrs graham regretted she was not there to meet them and explained to the millwards and wilsons the reasons she had given for neglecting to return their calls hoping they would excuse her as she was sure she did not mean to be uncivil and would be glad to see them at any time but she is a very singular lady mr lawrence added she we don't know what to make of her but i dare say you can tell us something about her for she is your tenant you know and she said she knew you a little all eyes turned to mr lawrence i thought he looked unnecessarily confused at being so appealed to i mrs markham said he you are mistaken i don't 
That is, I have seen her, certainly, but I am the last person you should apply to for information respecting Mrs. Graham. He then immediately turned to Rose, and asked her to favour the company with a song, or a tune on the piano. No, said she. You must ask Miss Wilson. She outshines us all in singing, and music, too. Miss Wilson demurred. She'll sing readily enough, said Fergus. If you'll undertake to stand by her, Mr. Lawrence, and turn over the leaves for her. I shall be most happy to do so, Miss Wilson. Will you allow me? She bridled her long neck and smiled, and suffered him to lead her to the instrument, where she played and sang, in her very best style, one piece after another, while he stood patiently by, leaning one hand on the back of her chair, and turning over the leaves of her book with the other. Perhaps he was as much charmed with her performance as she was. It was all very fine in its way, but I cannot say that it moved me very deeply. There was plenty of skill in execution, but precious little feeling. But we had not done with Mrs. Graham yet. I don't take wine, Mrs. Markham, said Mr. Millward, upon the introduction of that beverage. I'll take a little of your home-brewed ale. I always prefer you a home-brewed to anything else. Flattered at this compliment, my mother rang the bell, and a china jug of our best ale was presently brought and set before the worthy gentleman, who so well knew how to appreciate its excellences. Ah, now this is the thing, cried he, pouring out a glass of the same in a long stream, skilfully directed from the jug to the tumbler, so as to produce much foam without spilling a drop, and having surveyed it for a moment opposite the candle, he took a deep draught, and then smacked his lips, drew a long breath, and refilled his glass, my mother looking on with the greatest satisfaction. "'There's nothing like this, Mrs. Markham,' said he. "'I always maintain that there's nothing to compare with your home-brewed ale.' "'I'm sure I'm glad you like it, sir. I always look after the brewing myself, as well as the cheese and the butter. I like to have things well done while we're about it.' "'Quite right, Mrs. Markham.' "'But then, Mr. Millward, you don't think it wrong to take a little wine now and then, or a little spirits either,' said my mother, as she handed a smoking tumbler of gin and water to Mrs. Wilson, who affirmed that wine sat heavy on her stomach, and whose son Robert was at that moment helping himself to a pretty stiff glass of the same. "'By no means,' replied the oracle, with a Jove-like nod. These things are all blessings and mercies, if we only knew how to make use of them. But Mrs. Graham doesn't think so. You shall just hear now what she told us the other day. I told her I'd tell you. And my mother favoured the company, with the particular account of that lady's mistaken ideas and conduct regarding the matter in hand, concluding with, Now, don't you think it is wrong? Wrong, repeated the vicar, with more than common solemnity criminal i should say criminal not only is it making a fool of the boy but it is despising the gifts of providence and teaching him to trample them under his feet he then entered more fully into the question and explained at large the folly and impiety of such a proceeding my mother heard him with profoundest reverence and even mrs wilson vouchsafed to rest her tongue for a moment and listen in silence while she complacently sipped her gin and water. Mr. Lawrence sat with his elbow on the table, carelessly playing with his half-empty wine-glass, and covertly smiling to himself. "'But don't you think, Mr. Millward,' suggested he, when at length that gentleman paused in his discourse, "'that when a child may be naturally prone to intemperance, by the fault of its parents or ancestors, for instance, some precautions are advisable?' Now it was generally believed that Mr. Lawrence's father had shortened his days by intemperance. Oh, some precautions, it may be, but temperance, sir, is one thing, and abstinence another. But I have heard that, with some persons, temperance, that is, moderation, is almost impossible. And if abstinence be an evil, which some have doubted, no one will deny that excess is a greater some parents have entirely prohibited their children from tasting intoxicated liquors but a parent's authority cannot last for ever children are naturally prone to hanker after forbidden things and a child in such a case would be likely to have a strong curiosity to taste and try the effect of what has been so lauded and enjoyed by others so strictly forbidden to himself 
which curiosity would generally be gratified on the first convenient opportunity and the restraint once broken serious consequences might ensue i don't pretend to be a judge of such matters but it seems to me that this plan of mrs graham's as you describe it mrs markham extraordinary as it may be is not without its advantages for here you see the child is delivered at once from temptation he has no secret curiosity no hankering desire he is as well acquainted with the tempting liquors as he ever wishes to be and is thoroughly disgusted with them without having suffered from their effects and is that right sir have i not proven to you how wrong it is how contrary to scripture and to reason to teach a child to look with contempt and disgust upon the blessings of providence instead of to use them aright you may consider laudanum a blessing of providence sir replied mr lawrence smiling and yet you will allow that most of us had better abstain from it even in moderation but added he i would not desire you to follow out my simile too closely in witness whereof i finish my glass and take another i hope mr lawrence said my mother pushing the bottle towards him he politely declined and pushing his chair a little away from the table leant back towards me i was seated a trifle behind on the sofa beside eliza millward and carelessly asked me if i knew mrs graham i have met her once or twice i replied what do you think of her i cannot say that i like her much she is handsome or rather i should say distinguished and interesting in her appearance but by no means amiable a woman liable to take strong prejudices i should fancy and stick to them through thick and thin twisting everything into conformity with her own preconceived opinions too hard too sharp too bitter for my taste he made no reply but looked down and bit his lip and shortly after rose and sauntered up to miss wilson as much repelled by me i fancy as attracted by her i scarcely noticed it at the time but afterwards i was led to recall this and other trifling facts of a similar nature to my remembrance when but i must not anticipate we wound up the evening with dancing our worthy pastor thinking it no scandal to be present on the occasion though one of the village musicians was engaged to direct our evolutions with his violin but mary millward obstinately refused to join us and so did richard wilson though my mother earnestly entreated him to do so and even offered to be his partner we managed very well without them however with a single set of quadrilles and several country dances we carried it on to a pretty late hour and at length having called upon our musician to strike up a waltz i was just about to whirl eliza round in that delightful dance accompanied by lawrence and jane wilson and ferguson rose when mr millward interposed with no no i don't allow that come it's time to be going now oh no papa pleaded eliza high time me girl high time moderation in all things remember that's the plan let your moderation be known unto all men but in revenge i followed eliza into the dimly lighted passage where under pretence of helping her on with her shawl i fear i must plead guilty to snatching a kiss behind her father's back while he was enveloping his throat and shin in the folds of a mighty comforter but alas in turning round there was my mother close beside me the consequence was that no sooner were the guests departed than i was doomed to a very serious remonstrance which unpleasantly checked the galloping course of my spirits and made a disagreeable close to the evening my dear gilbert said she i wish you wouldn't do so you know how deeply i have your advantage at heart how i love you and prize you above everything else in the world and how much i long to see you well settled in life and how bitterly it would grieve me to see you married to that girl or any other in the neighbourhood what you see in her i don't know it isn't only the want of money that i think about nothing of the kind but there's neither beauty nor cleverness nor goodness nor anything else that's desirable if you knew your own value as i do you wouldn't dream of it do wait a while and see if you bind yourself to her you'll repent it all your lifetime when you look round and see how many better there are take my word for it you will well mother do be quiet i hate to be lectured 
i'm not going to marry yet i tell you but dear me mayn't i enjoy myself at all yes my dear boy but not in that way indeed you shouldn't do such things you would be wronging the girl if she were what she ought to be but i assure you she is as artful a little hussy as anybody need wish to see and you'll get entangled in her snares before you know where you are and if you marry her gilbert you'll break my heart so there's an end of it well don't cry about it mother said i for the tears were gushing from her eyes there let that kiss efface the one i gave eliza don't abuse her any more and set your mind at rest for i'll promise never that is i'll promise to think twice before i take any important step you seriously disapprove of so saying i lighted my candle and went to bed considerably quenched in spirit End of chapter four tenant of wildfell hall by anne bronte this librivox recording is in the public domain it was about the close of the month that yielding at length to the urgent importunities of rose i accompanied her in a visit to wildfell hall to our surprise we were ushered into a room where the first object that met the eye was a painter's easel with a table beside it covered with rolls of canvas bottles of oil and varnish palette brushes paints etc leaning against the wall were several sketches in various stages of progression and a few finished paintings mostly of landscapes and figures i must make you welcome to my studio said mrs graham there is no fire in the sitting-room to-day and it is rather too cold to show you into a place with an empty grate and disengaging a couple of chairs from the artistical lumber that usurped them she bid us be seated and resumed her place beside the easel not facing it exactly but now and then glancing at the picture upon it while she conversed and giving it an occasional touch with her brush as if she found it impossible to wean her attention entirely from her occupation to fix it upon her guests it was a view of wildfell hall i seen it early morning from the field below rising in dark relief against a sky of clear silvery blue with a few red streaks on the horizon faithfully drawn and coloured and very elegantly and artistically handled i see your heart is in your work mrs graham observed i i must beg you to go on with it for if you suffer our presence to interrupt you we shall be constrained to regard ourselves as unwelcome intruders oh no replied she throwing her brush on to the table as if startled into politeness i am not so beset with visitors but that i can readily spare a few minutes to the few that do favour me with their company you have almost completed your painting said i approaching to observe it more closely and surveying it with a greater degree of admiration and delight than i care to express a few more touches in the foreground will finish it i should think but why have you called it fernley manor cumberland instead of wildfell hall shire i asked alluding to the name she had traced in small characters at the bottom of the canvas but immediately i was sensible of having committed an act of impertinence in so doing for she coloured and hesitated but after a moment's pause with a kind of desperate frankness she replied because i have friends acquaintances at least in the world from whom i desire my present abode to be concealed and as they might see the picture and might possibly recognise the style in spite of the false initials i have put in the corner i take the precaution to give a false name to the place also in order to put them on a wrong scent if they should attempt to trace me out by it then you don't intend to keep the picture said i anxious to say anything to change the subject no i cannot afford to paint for my own amusement mamma sends all her pictures to london said arthur and then somebody sells them for her there and sends us the money in looking round upon the other pieces i remarked a pretty sketch of linden hope from the top of the hill another view of the old hall basking in the sunny haze of a quiet summer afternoon and a simple but striking little picture of a child brooding with looks of silent but deep and sorrowful regret over a handful of withered flowers with glimpses of dark low hills and autumnal fields behind it and a dull beclouded sky above you see there is a sad dearth of subjects observed the fair artist i took the old hall once on a moonlight night and i suppose i must take it again on a snowy winter's day and then again on a dark cloudy evening for i really have nothing else to paint i have been told that you have a fine view of the sea somewhere in the neighbourhood is it true and is it within walking distance yes if you don't object to walking four miles 
or nearly so, little short of eight miles there and back, over a somewhat rough, fatiguing road. In what direction does it lie? I described the situation as well as I could, and was entering upon an explanation of the various roads, lanes, and fields to be traversed in order to reach it, the going straight on, and turnings to the right and to the left, when she checked me with, Oh, stop! Don't tell me now. I shall forget every word of your directions before I require them. I shall not think about going till next spring, and then perhaps I may trouble you. At present we have the winter before us, and— She suddenly paused, with a suppressed exclamation, started up from her seat, and saying, Excuse me one moment, hurried from the room, and shut the door behind her. Curious to see what had startled her so, I looked towards the window, for her eyes had been carelessly fixed upon it the moment before, and just beheld the skirts of a man's coat vanishing behind a large holly-bush that stood between the window and the porch. It's Mamma's friend, said Arthur. Rose and I looked at each other. I don't know what to make of her at all, whispered Rose. The child looked at her in grave surprise. She straightway began to talk to him on indifferent matters. While I amused myself with looking at the pictures, there was one in an obscure corner that I had not before observed. It was a little child, seated on the grass with its lap full of flowers, the tiny features and large blue eyes, smiling through a shock of light brown curls, shaken over the forehead as it bent above its treasure, bore sufficient resemblance to those of the young gentleman before me, to proclaim it a portrait of Arthur Graham in his early infancy. In taking this up to bring it to the light, I discovered another behind it, with his face to the wall. I ventured to take that up, too. It was the portrait of a gentleman, in the full prime of youthful manhood, handsome enough, and not badly executed. But if done by the same hand as the others, it was evidently some years before, for there was far more careful minuteness of detail, and less of that freshness of colouring and freedom of handling that delighted and surprised me in them. Nevertheless, I surveyed it with considerable interest. There was a certain individuality in the features and expression that stamped it at once a successful likeness. The bright blue eyes regarded the spectator with a kind of lurking drollery. You almost expected to see them wink. The lips, a little too voluptuously full, seemed ready to break into a smile. The warmly tinted cheeks were embellished with a luxuriant growth of reddish whiskers, while the bright chestnut hair, clustering in abundant wavy curls, trespassed too much upon the forehead, and seemed to intimate that the owner thereof was prouder of his beauty than his intellect, as perhaps he had reason to be, and yet he looked no fool. I had not had the portrait in my hands two minutes before the fair artist returned. Only someone come about the pictures, said she, in apology for her abrupt departure. I told him to wait. I fear it will be considered an act of impertinence, I said, to presume to look at a picture that the artist has turned to the wall, but may I ask— It is an act of very great impertinence, sir, and therefore I beg you will ask nothing about it, for your curiosity will not be gratified, replied she, attempting to cover the tartness of her rebuke with a smile, but I could see by her flushed cheek and kindling eye that she was seriously annoyed. I was only going to ask if you had painted it yourself, said I, sulkily resigning the picture into her hands, for without a grain of ceremony she took it from me and quickly restoring it to the dark corner, with his face to the wall, placed the other against it as before, and then turned to me and laughed. But I was in no humour for jesting. I carelessly turned to the window, and stood looking out upon the desolate garden, leaving her to talk to Rose for a minute or two, and then, telling my sister it was time to go, shook hands with the little gentleman, coolly bowed to the lady, and moved towards the door. But having bid adieu to Rose, Mrs. Graham presented her hand to me, saying with a soft voice, and by no means a disagreeable smile, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, Mr. Markham. I am sorry I offended you by my abruptness. When a lady condescends to apologise, there is no keeping one's anger, of course. So we parted good friends for once, and this time I squeezed her hand with a cordial, not a spiteful pressure. End of chapter 5